scientific point of view. All right, so, uh, and I'm, uh, I have to apologize a little bit up front. I'm using an iPad rather than my computer because the camera is so much better as it turns out. And the phone is, the, the um, camera is in a slightly weird offset place. So if it looks like I'm looking cockeyed, somewhere else. I'm, I'm really looking at you, honestly, <laughs> except when I'm looking down at the paper. All right. So in, in this talk, I'm going to try and examine optimism, and in particular, its connection to science, which I hope to convince you is both very deep and crucial, both to the functioning of science and to the general wellness of a scientific society. So to begin with, I'm going to try first to complicate the idea of optimism uh, beyond its obvious and most common meaning. So not simplify it, but rather complicate it because these common meanings have been collected uh, over many years and they refer mostly, I think, to a mental or psychological disposition. And I'd rather consider optimism as a sort of a philosophical position tied to scientific practice in, in a somewhat deeper, I hope, meaning. Um, I'm going to make the claim that science actually creates optimism. Indeed, I, I have made the claim, and I could make it now too, that I think science invented optimism um, or a certain kind of optimism, and further that it brings an optimistic outlook to those societies where it has become embedded in the lives of the citizens. I understand these may seem like extravagant claims, but I believe they can be supported, and I hope they're provocative enough to, uh, to get you thinking about it and, and talking about it. So the first thing I'd like to say is that optimism, I believe, is not, is not baked into the human brain by evolution, which is a somewhat common viewpoint in the, uh, especially in the self-actualization literature and in much of evolutionary neuropsychology. Uh, I don't believe this, I don't believe there's much evidence for it. I'm not going to go deeply into that, but I, I don't believe there's, there's much to it, really. I think it just sounds nice. Um, to wit, uh, you might be interested to learn that the word optimism, I was interested to learn this, the word optimism did not exist until 1759 when it was invented, that's right, invented by uh, Voltaire for his famous satirical novel Candide or The Optimist. Before then, the roots for optimism existed, optimus or optimum, the Latin roots since, I suppose, since Roman times. Um, but they refer to things or situations, that is the best version of a thing or a situation, the best instantiation. They had nothing to do with a personal outlook, with a philosophical outlook or an emotional outlook. Now, since that time, optimism has accumulated many meanings and I think lost some important ones. So I'd like to sort of be explicit about it and try and regain that or, or redefine it once again. Um, Again, I, I think it's not merely an emotional disposition that tends to see things um, more positive over the negative. I don't think it's a self-actualization technique, good for mindfulness or, or power of positive thinking. I mean, it is all of those things as well. Um, and, it, and it's not, uh, I think, only uh, the more pejorative meaning of it, which is a sort of a naive gullibility, uh, childish view of things. Optimism is for suckers or something like that. Um, so I'd like to try and develop a more complex view of optimism. All right, so where does this optimism come from? Uh, optimism or scientific optimism, I think, comes from many sources, but the most proximal, the most immediate, and the strongest of them, I would say, is the idea of progress. Um, progress is another idea that I think we all believe has been around since people were drawing things on caves or something like that. But that's also not really the case when you examine it carefully. Um, I mean, yes, there was progress. We should really talk maybe about the idea of progress, which was not really very prevalent until I would say relatively recently. Uh, it didn't have much of a presence until really the scientific revolution uh, in the mid 16th century. The Athenian Greeks, a civilization who we admire for their philosophy, for their mathematics, for their art and so forth, actually had virtually no word for progress, didn't believe in progress. They ent entertained as many, especially ancient civilizations, but even some current ideas, philosophical ideas do, maintained a sort of a circular version of the world, a, a, a recurring version of, of world events, much like the seasons recur, that, that things decayed and were revitalized. The circle was the perfect shape, for example, and so forth. And so that doesn't really give you a sense of progress, right? Um, it's not really linear. Uh, 
And then progress was so slow as to be virtually imperceptible. For the, for the 2000 years, let's say from 500 BC, Athenian Greece to 1500 AD Europe, um, there was such slow progress that, that, that 2000, that's 2000 years, so that's 50 generations of human beings with brains just like yours and mine, um, essentially were born, lived and perished in the same technology. It just didn't change on, on, on even a generational scale. So people lived as their parents lived and their children expected to live as their parents lived. And you expected your children to live as you did. And so the idea of progress was not really there. And so, so another kind of big or extravagant claim that I'm gonna try and support is that, um, that for years and years, humans lived with these big brains, but they lived in a world uh, with life as, as it was delivered. Whereas I think post-science, uh, we came to a more optimistic view, which I would say is encapsulated by the phrase, it could be otherwise. We began to think that things could be otherwise. So progress, like optimism, is I think a relatively recent part of our lives. Now, there's an important corollary here that I wanna get back to by the end of this, but I'm gonna mention it here to make sure that it's here because I think it's part of the public engagement thing. Um, in order for progress or the idea of progress to be palpable and important and to give rise to optimism, it has to be public. It has to be made public. It has to be part of the public discourse. And so after the first scientific revolution, I'm going to talk about a second one at the moment. That's why I call it the first. But after the scientific revolution, one of the things that occurred was there was a there were many early efforts to popularize science, science books by the by what we now consider the great scientists, Galileo, Descartes, uh, Bacon, people like that, were published in vernacular languages. And those that were published in classical Latin were quickly translated into popular vernacular languages. There were public lectures, there were displays, there were all sorts of things that engaged the public in, in science. And I think it's critical still for the idea of progress in the culture in order for optimism uh, to flourish. So let's take a moment to think about the scientific revolution. What was it? Where did it come from? These questions are not merely, I think, of historical interest because the answers, it turns out, contain the roots of modern science, the way it's practiced now, um, the way we train scientists and the way science is practiced. So where did the scientific revolution come from? Uh, this is, a big, this is a big topic, and there are many historians and scholars who work very hard on this and have come up with numerous ideas about it, so I don't want to pretend that I'm one of them, but I've cherry-picked three that I consider important, and I consider them important because I think they're still current. They're not merely the way the antecedents for the scientific revolution, but they're still current in, in current scientific practice. One, of course, was the Renaissance. The Renaissance is a bit odd because it really wasn't very progressive. It was really a look back. I mean, it was a rebirth, a renaissance, as it were. Um, and it was an attempt to sort of uh, uh, rediscover classical and uh, antiquity, the, the virtues of classical antiquity and classical thinking. But it did, it did increase the idea of the individual as an artist. So individuality became important instead of just being part of a sort of feudal hierarchy. Um, place became more fluid, your ability to move around in society became more fluid, and, it, and, the, and a mercantile and educated class was developed. Yet more important, I think, was the Reformation. The Reformation is very interesting. It, it, it predated science and, and, and supported it in two very important ways, I think. One was it was highly anti-authoritarian, of course. It was, um, it, it challenged the authority of Rome, of the, of the papal church, and, and that anti-authoritarianism with that renunciation of authority as the source of all knowledge became important in the beginnings of science. In addition to which, I think the Reformation, and again, I'm, I'm not a theology expert, but, but for me, the important element here is that the Reformation turned people's thinking from a so sort of inner monastic view of how to prepare the spirit for an afterlife to a more earthly view of how to prepare for an afterlife, to do good, to do good things here on the earth. And that dovetailed very nicely with Francis Bacon's ideas about science and the beginnings of science, that it would be used for the betterment of human life. 
And so this notion of industriousness or doing works, as it were, as it were, I think the two of those things worked quite well together in the beginning. It's somewhat ironic because of the difficulties that seem we seem to have in, in the modern world between religion and science, and we certainly can talk about that. Um, but but in the beginning, that's not the way it was, and and uh, we should think some about that. And finally, the third thing I say would be the voyages of discovery of the late 15th or early, early 16th century, uh, Columbus, Magellan, Raleigh, people like that, who went out of the Mediterranean, went to new lands, made new discoveries, new worlds, new uh, vegetables, plants, animals, all sorts of things were, were brought back to what amounted to Europe, which up until that time had been centered on the Mediterranean. Indeed, the Mediterranean literally means center of the world. And so suddenly it wasn't the center of the world anymore. There was there's this notion of discovery. So those three things, the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the age of discovery, I think, are the primary antecedents of the scientific revolution. What was the scientific revolution? Well, again, there's a lot of work being done on this. And it's, it's been called everything from it never happened. There was no such thing as the scientific revolution to it's the most pivotal event in all of human history. So there's a, quite a range of things, I believe we can talk about a scientific revolution because it makes it easier to talk about it. Um, and I think there, it, it really was not a revolution in the sense, of course, of bullets and flags and banners and proclamations and things like that. I'd rather think of it as a kind of a cognitive revolution, if you will, a cognitive leap that was created by, by a group of ideas that themselves were not necessarily new, but coalesced for the first time into a kind of a new cognitive constellation, if you will. And I'm, I'm gonna pick five of them. I think there are other ones, but again, I've picked five because these five still form the basis of modern science. And I think what's interesting about them is you don't need a PhD to figure these things out, to practice them. But this is still what we, in addition to the facts and the techniques and all the other stuff that we teach graduate students and postdocs, really these are the five things they have to master if they wanna practice real science. So, and you don't need a PhD in anything to do this. So what are they? I'm gonna go through them quickly. The first is, I've already sort of alluded to this, the renunciation of authority. The knowledge does not come from the state, the church or Aristotle. The knowledge has to be empirical, that there is some sense of empiricism about knowledge. This is Francis Bacon speaking now, is often considered sort of the father of the scientific revolution. This is the early 1600s. And there's a wonderful quote from, from Bacon that, that's gotten lost, I feel, or at least I've, I, I don't hear it, but I'm gonna paraphrase it a little bit. And Bacon said essentially, previously, truth came from authority. Henceforth, authority will come from truth. I think we should pause for just a moment and think about how big an idea that is in so few words. That instead of truth coming from authority, authority will come from truth. Where will that truth come from? Well, that's the second big idea, and that's the notion of an experiment, of evidence. So experiment is another one of these ideas that I think we all think has been around for forever. That people have been doing experiments since you know human beings banged a couple of stones together or figured out how to make fire, right, or something like that. But that's not actually true. I'm not talking about experience or trial and error, which, yes, has been around for a long time, but rather the idea of an experiment, which is quite an unnatural idea. This is where you take a piece of nature out of context, you, you isolate it, you prod it, you poke it, you torture it according to Sam Francis Bacon in order to have it show you its innards, in order to get a glimpse of its innards of how it works. And, and this was evidence then. And the idea that you could do this and that you would get good evidence of actually how things worked is quite a new idea. So experiment. Now, along with experiment, I don't know how many people saw this coming, but along with experiment comes a lot of failure, as I've said in this previous book, um, because most experiments in fact fail. That I think is a crucial third element to the scientific revolution, the cognitive ideas of scientific revolution, that failure happens, um, failure happens a lot. There are high rates of failure and struggle, and that this actually gives credence to the experimentally gained knowledge that fallibility is crucial because infallibility is a kind of authoritarianism. So fallibility actually works as a positive in, in science here. The fourth thing is what I call, or what other people have called provisional belief. 
Science is not seeking an ultimate truth with a capital T. It's rather looking for a series of increasingly more correct beliefs that undergo constant and dynamic re revision. The great historian of science, Charles Gillespie, who passed away this past year, uh, once said famously, in science, revision is a victory. I think that's an important idea to keep in mind. So we're looking for provisional truth, provisional belief, as it were, and that things are right enough and we'll make them righter as we move on. But it's a dynamic and continuing process. And finally, the fifth thing is counterintuitive thinking. So I think we often hear that, oh, a lot of scientific discoveries are made by intuition. I would say that's not true. I'd say they're made by counterintuition, by the readiness to consider what is not common sense, what is not obviously or apparently the case. Um, and so uh, it forces our minds to expand beyond common experience. All right, so those, so those five things, uh, renunciation of authority, experimentation, fallibility, provisional belief and counterintuitive thinking. And from that comes a, a remarkably accelerated rate of progress. Uh, I mean, Arthur Kessler, I think famously said it was as if a new species of human had arrived on the planet. Suddenly there is an accelerated rate of progress, um, both technologically and intellectually. Um, and this gives rise to this optimism and this notion that remember early scientists, the word scientist actually didn't arrive until the 1830s. Early scientists called themselves natural philosophers, and they believed that what they were looking at, what they were working on, was to understand the mind of the creator. By looking into the creation, by examining the creation, we could understand better, come closer to the very mind of the creator. You might call this hubris. And indeed, I think early science had a great deal of hubris about it. So this optimism could be, could be taken for hubris, although I don't think it had the same kind of cockiness that, that straight hubris has, because in science, it's also yoked to humility. Because it turns out that even though I think I can learn everything there might be to learn about the universe or learn a great deal about the universe and how it works, the more I learn, it seems the more I don't know, the more I come to grips with the fact that I don't know so much. And so yoke to you, hubris is humility. And this, I think, is the key to the scientific optimism. It's a complicated creature that includes the, the kind of uncommon coexistence of hubris and, uh, and humility. All right, so to one problem here is that this all sort of begs the question of why so many people currently harbor a somewhat ambivalent, if not outright malevolent, uh, attitude towards the sciences. I mean, if it's so optimistic and it's applying a kind of optimism that can permeate a society and change a society in, in such positive ways, what, what's the source of the mistrust? The science feel less optimistic than it used to? Is it less optimistic? than it used to be? Is there something about modern science that's lost this sense of optimism? So the optimistic view that I've outlined so far arose in an era of scientific progress that stretched more or less from the late 16th century, mid 1500s or so, mid to late 1500s, through uh, the mid to the end of the 19th century, maybe 250 to 300 years or so, the blink of a historical eye, I'd say. Um, there's no particular name for this historical period, but it includes things like the Enlightenment, the Romantic Era, the Industrial Age, the Machine Age, the Age of Wonder, all of these things. But around the middle of the 19th century, I would say, the mid 1800s, science suddenly finds itself in a somewhat unexpected and I would say slightly untenable or uncomfortable position. It's still able to produce gadgets and cures and at a remarkable rate, it's still able to advance knowledge. Um, but it has within it, I think, the seeds of its own destruction. Now, I don't mean to sound overly dramatic here, and I don't think I am, because science or activities like it have appeared in human history and other human cultures before, uh, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, um, the, uh, the Arabs, the Chinese, etc. All of these cultures um, had historically developed some form of science, and all of them have come to a halt. All of them historically at some point came to a halt, stopped being pursued, uh, left the culture as it were, disappeared from the culture. And our current form of science, even given its now international character and impressive rates of discovery and progress that continue, I think is not guaranteed to persist. 
And, and we have to recognize that there's a certain fragility to science that I think people don't think of. Um, and in fact, European science or modern science as we know it now almost ended as well. We don't hear about this because the textbooks that we're treated to have these sort of historical narratives, these grand arcs of discovery um, where we go from Galileo to Einstein and there's never a stumble or a problem or anything like that. Um, this potted history of science is that taught in our schools and university, it just doesn't admit of any disruption to this grand march of this grand march forward. But I would say science did come very close to losing its way, almost came to an end, and then recovered by reinventing the world to some extent and itself. The primary cause of this, I think, in its simplest terms, and again, there's a lot of scholarship on this, well, not as much as you'd like, actually, I think. But I think the primary cause was that the hubris of science outran the humility. The optimism equation became unbalanced. Discoveries piled on top of discoveries and it developed a sense that, that ultimate knowledge of the universe was possible, that the place was predictable as lunar eclipses and the flight of parabolic, uh, parabolic flight of cannonballs, that, um, that the universe was lawful, these laws could be known, the universe was essentially deterministic. Now, much as we all believe we prefer certainty over uncertainty, I think just a momentary bit of reflection would reveal that actually that's a very pessimistic perspective. If everything just happens according to some predetermined set of laws and rules that can be expressed in a few mathematical formulae, then, then where are free will? Where is morality? Where is choice, yearning, intentionality, and the, any kind of enchantment at all? I mean, what a dull and dreary place we live in. No surprises. Worse, I think this clockwork version of science uh, that became very popular gave rise to some very ill-conceived notions like eugenics and uh, more deadly artillery, industrial pollution, whole raft of ill-conceived uses for science. And, and I think this is the science that the public recoils from uh, to some extent, uh, fearing the, the potential power of the scientific juggernaut of which uh, seems mostly beyond their understanding and, and is exclusive to some secret club of PhD type people. Um, it lacks the profound optimism that science had, uh, being now just a purveyor of shiny new technology, uh, largely disconnected from the public that it, that it was always intended and always should think to serve. But I don't think this is current science. This is an idea about science. This was 19th century science, but I don't think it's current science. I don't think it is the science that goes on today in laboratories and observatories and field stations. Regardless of what you've been taught in school, which is that old science, it's kind of outdated. And why we still teach this outdated science in our schools, I, I don't know why, but I do know that it could be changed. And I think that's Critical important, critically important. So here's how I think it really went. Here's how I think we should be talking about. And I'll end with this. So by the later part of the 19th century, science is making a, a somewhat slow and, and subtle transition. Um, and this began with a biologist uh, and, and his very disruptive idea. Uh, I think you know probably who I'm talking about, but looking at what he called the buzzing, blooming diversity of life, Charles Darwin comes to what in my opinion, may be the most counterintuitive idea since Copernicus, when he apprehends that the source of the tremendous complexity and organization of life can result from essential randomness hooked up to a feedback cycle, a feedback loop, which he calls natural selection, not having the word feedback loop in his vocabulary. So the science of life is not deterministic. It is fundamentally very undeterministic. Indeed, it's that undeterminism that creates the wonderful diversity of life. There's no simple set of rules and laws that could ever have developed the multiplicity, multiplicity of living forms that we observe and maintain it as a dynamic and at the same time stable system. This is what's so remarkable, right? So it's random at, at base, and yet it's rather stable. It's rather stable and in many ways even predictable. Yes, species go extinct and this and that, but the idea of a species is nonetheless a very stable idea. Well, so we consider Darwin to be the father of modern biology, but actually this idea had in 
incredibly important ramifications in all the science. Hard upon Darwin comes Boltzmann and statistical uh, mechanics, a, a reworking of thermodynamics. Um, there's relativity, of course, there's quantum theory, there's the undecidability of Gödel's mathematics. Uh, there's even now a science called chaos theory. So which studies exactly that, takes as its subject chaos and, and randomness. Um, so, so science increasingly reveals that randomness and uncertainty is woven into the very fabric of the universe. At the very foundations of knowledge, there's a kind of an ultimate uncertainty. All right, now I grant you ultimate uncertainty may not sound like such a positive idea, but, but paradoxically, it's actually a source of a newfound optimism. Uncertainty opens a door to new possibilities and opportunities that have been denied to us essentially by a deterministic universe. The, and, it, and also I have to say, it seems that these, these five cognitive strategies of the scientific revolution, I like to call them the five cogs, they work just as well in the science of uncertainty. And indeed they actually work even better Uncertainty fits in especially well with profound ignorance, with regular failure, with weird experiments, provisional truth and counterintuitiveness. I think with scientific uncertainty, we find new tools. And again, actually maybe counterintuitively, greater powers of prediction. Scientific uncertainty can be calculated and be put to use. The technology that runs our smartphones, GPS, that, that's behind climate models and things like that. Just a few examples that, re, that rely on chaotic or non-deterministic dynamics to perform. I think we need to recognize that uncertainty is not necessarily unpredictable, not necessarily unreliable, not necessarily undependable. Uh, unsettled science is, is not um, unsound science. So the place we live now is not a clockwork destined to a certain conclusion and imprisoned by intractable laws. Rather, I think we should look at it as a field of, of new possibilities. But, but I think we've left the public behind in the, the old world of deterministic science and failed to make explicit to them the pleasures of optimism and uncertainty. It is, I believe now, the responsibility of science to communicate the value of uncertainty to the public. It's hard, time for us to do the hard work of introducing this sort of second scientific revolution or the transformation of science into the culture, just as our forebears had to do for the first scientific revolution. I personally find this as an opportunity for science to join, not oppose, the humanities, the arts, philosophy, and religion, giving up its claim to certainty as knowledge, and bringing to society a brand of unsettled but not unsound knowledge where indeterminacy, indeterminacy and intelligibility can coexist. Um, a vision of the world that includes greater progress and optimism along with realistic uncertainty, what I would call optimistic uncertainty. In an uncertain universe, it's even, it is even more true that things not need to be, things do not need be as they are delivered. It could indeed be otherwise. Thanks.